Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and today we are exploring, once again, the epic of Gilgamesh. In our previous uh, podcast episode, we explored the epic of Gilgamesh as the oldest work of instantiated civilizational consciousness, a work that embodies the ancient civilizational struggle for the birth of civilization. In much the same way, this episode will detail uh, the same thing, but from a different purview. The last episode, we looked at Gilgamesh as the hero king, the founder of civilization, drawing on uh, the archetype of the hero king provided by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel in his uh, lectures on the philosophy of history. Now we're going to turn to the role of sex, sexuality, and the female nature through Shamhat in bringing about civilization, particularly as it relates to the most memorable character of the epic, Enkidu, the wild man created by the god Aruru to rival and challenge Gilgamesh, but who ends up befriending Gilgamesh and also the individual whose death causes Gilgamesh existential dread over the more over the reality of mortality. So Enkidu is, in my opinion, the most interesting figure to examine from a purely mythological perspective. While Gilgamesh is considered to have been a historical person, scholars remain divided as to whether Enkidu uh, would, have been, would have been based on a historical counselor or not. Regardless, uh, many symbolic themes that are contained within the character of Enkidu is what we want to concern ourselves with today. And so the first theme that we should explore when dealing with Enkidu is Enkidu as the wild man or the savage man. After all, that, that is what Enkidu is when he is introduced to us. Enkidu is created by the gods to challenge Gilgamesh and his arrogance. In principle, the gods are terrified at what Gilgamesh is becoming and what he might do to them through his power and the adoration he receives from his people. If you recall from the first episode, we examined briefly the sociological and the religious aspects of Sumerian society. It was a very bleak religion. It was a bleak pantheon. Uh, the Sumerians were deeply religious. The temple was the center of their civilizational life. But as the Epic of Gilgamesh indicates, by the fact that it is an epic poem uh, dealing with the hero Gilgamesh, uh, the people in Uruk were praising humans rather than gods, and those kingly humans had usurped the place of divinity. Thus, Enkidu is created by the gods to challenge Gilgamesh in his arrogance. Because Gilgamesh is strong, but also handsome, and handsomeness or beauty is a common feature in ancient uh, mythological epic literature. The same is true uh, in, in Achilles, in the Iliad. Ili in the Iliad, Homer depicts and describes Achilles in, in very beautiful, handsome language. Because Gilgamesh is strong and handsome, the gods create Enkidu to rival Gilgamesh in his strength, but he lacks the beauty of Gilgamesh and he lacks the cultivated manners of Gilgamesh. This is because Enkidu represents primordial man, the hairy, disheveled, animalistic brute who doesn't have reason, no rationality, and lives like the animals, that is purely on his bodily desires and instincts. He is the great ape of years before, a man who is yet a man, a man who is more animalistic than civilized and refined. Even after entering Uruk, Enkidu does not know how to eat, how to drink, or properly, properly dress himself, all of the quintessential hallmarks 
of civilized and urban living, Enkidu lacks. Enkidu, as many astrologists, Assyriologists uh, point out, uh, likely represents the homogenized composite of the man outside of the walls, the barbarian whose speech doesn't make much sense, whose very way of life with the animals uh, seems shocking and unbefitting of a man, but who seeks out the civilized life offered by the Neolithic Revolution. It's also important to remember that it were uh, that shepherds were the people who first came across Enkidu. Enkidu's uh, existence is literally outside of the walls of Uruk in the wild with the animals. Uh, it's also important to remember that when we're reading the Epic of Gilgamesh, if our dating is correct, it was written uh, in the mid-2300 BCs. Again, that's not long after uh, the Neolithic Revolution has taken place. The Neolithic Revolution marked a major turning point in human history. No longer the wandering brutes of the past, man became a civilized, rational-thinking, law-abiding, nature-conquering being. Man was in the terminology of Hannah Arendt, Homo Faber. All of these themes are present in the Epic of Gilgamesh and are contained in the person and persona of Enkidu. When he is first introduced, quote, he knows not a people nor even a country, end quote. He is an unsettled uh, savage. He alone, he is alone, he is a wanderer, he is a brute who does not possess the faculty of reason. He is described like an animal, ungroomed hair, and bestial and beastly in attitude, disposition, and power. It is only after his taming and settling in Uruk that he becomes a man, especially in the Aristotelian sense, a rational and social, i.e. political, animal. Prior to his arrival in Uruk, Enkidu is an irrational animal and an asocial, solitary animal. The bumbling, stumbling, brutish beast that Enkidu is before his encounter with Shamhat and arrival in Uruk is the primordial man before the Neolithic Revolution. And as some men founded cities, those who did not were intrigued by the towering walls and houses that began to dot the landscape, and they inquisitively uh, wanted to know about the city, thus the birth of reason in man. Rationality, also, is what the ancient philosophers, Greek, Roman, and Christian, considered to be the distinctive feature of man as the rational animal. Where animals simply followed their instincts and desires, their vegetative and appetitive soul, man has the capacity of mastering his instincts and desires and ordering them through the rational soul, through reason, to more productive and civilized ends. As Aristotle said in the Politics, civilized man can be known by how he eats and has sex. Reread the first two tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh very carefully in this light. Enkidu's turn to civilization is based on sex and eating. In the words of John Milton in Paradise Lost, which so beautifully captures in poetic form this deep philosophical and sociological reality, yet not so strictly hath our Lord imposed labor as to debar us when we need refreshment, whether food or talk between, food of the mind or this sweet intercourse of looks and smiles, for smiles from reason flow to brute denied, and are of love the food, love not the lowest end of human life. Man, unlike animal, 
unlike the debased, irrational animal, can appreciate the sweetness of life, sex, and food. As Dante said in Purgatorio, the soul which is created quick to love responds to everything that pleases just as soon as beauty wakens it to act. Enkidu is at first the wild man, the primordial man who follows his animalistic instincts. He is, after all, living with animals. Animal man is the antithesis to civilized man. This is why the gods created Enkidu to rival civilized Gilgamesh. Animal man in his brutality, pure desire, and irrationality threatens everything that rational and civilized man uh, has constructed. Order, social function, the taming of the animalistic impulses, which are now directed to spouse, family, and country, and so forth. Thus, this is what Enkidu must lose before being civilized. He must lose his brutality, his animalism, and his uncontrollable desire as he roams aim aimlessly like the gazelles that he is with, simply feeding his desires and moving on to another location to repeat the process over and over. Now, another theme that is worthwhile to pursue is the encounter of Enkidu and Shamhat, the role that sex, food, and marriage play in civilization. Shamhat is the tertiary protagonist in the story and the most important woman in the story. If you discount Ishtar, you can go back and forth uh, whether Shamhat or Ishtar should be considered the most important woman in the story. Uh, Shamhat is in the story longer than Ishtar. Uh, she is a, a sacred harlot, a sex priestess, which was an important position in ancient Mesopotamian society. Uh, Herodotus has a lot to say about this cultic practice of, uh, of sacred sex in Mesopotamian society. Um, and it's true, Herodotus sort of deplored the uh, practice of sacred sex in the fertility cults. Nevertheless, Shamhat serves a very important role in the story because she is the individual who civilizes Enkidu, teaches him the sacred meaning of sex and the family, teaches him how to eat and dress, and uh, inducts Enkidu into social life. It is interesting here to note uh, to highlight how Enkidu, created by the fertility goddess Aruru, is civilized through the sexual act. There's a sort of poetic irony there. Where Enkidu is solitary, Uruk civilization is social. Where Enkidu is an animal, the citizens of Uruk are men. They are civilized. Where Enkidu doesn't know how to uh, eat like a person, as the poem says, instead foraging like the animals, uh, the people of Uruk have table manners, cooked food, and appropriate dress. Quote, For man, when perfected, is the best of animals, but when separated from law and justice, he is the worst of all. That is what Aristotle said in the politics, and that can certainly be applied here to understanding Enkidu. Those fateful words from Aristotle accurately summarize the dialectical contrast between Enkidu, the wild man, and Enkidu, the civilized man, after his encounter with Shamhat. When the hunter tasked with finding Enkidu discovers him, having brought Shamhat along, he, infirm, uh, he informs her uh, that this is he, Shamhat, uncradle your bosom, bear your sex, let him take in your charms, do not recoil, but take in his scent, he will see you and will approach you. Spread your clothing so he may lie on you. Do for the man the work of a woman. Let his passions caress and embrace you. His herd will spurn him, though he grew up amongst it. 
The encounter of Enkidu with Shamhat has been one of the most discussed parts of the epic. Feminists naturally have despised it for its patriarchal and demeaning language and the dialectic entailed. Anthropologists and philosophers, by contrast, have generally seen the tremendous symbolism entailed in the encounter of wild man and civilized woman and the dignified position that Shamhat plays in the narrative becoming the sort of adoptive wife of Enkidu. Not all feminists have recoiled at the depiction of sacred sex and the role of sex in the birth of civilization. Camille Paglia uh, stands against the grain insofar that uh, she sees the powerful role of the feminine mystique in the sex act and the power that uh, women holds over man through the sex act. As Paglia explained in Sexual Personae, the sexual act brings out the true character of a man, his depravity or exquisiteness. Also, from the feminine perspective, the power of women uh, over men as it relates to the civilizing role of sex and how through the sexual act came the glories of ordered civilization where men had to tame and order their sexual drive and replace belly magic with head magic, i.e., uh, Head magic, rational order, overcoming chaotic, watery belly order. This transformation in civilization, Palia notes, though men took the lead, was ultimately spurred by man's uh, simultaneous fear and honoring of woman and entirely related to uh, the sexual act and sexual appetites. Sex not only brought forth personal identity and distinctiveness, it brought about ordered civilization in of itself. And again, how does Enkidu enter civilization but through the sexual act with Shamhat? Although the Catholic uh, Church and its social teachings are often demeaned as being anti-women by those who know next to nothing about the complexity and the depth of Catholic anthropological and civilizational thinking, Catholic sexual ethics also expounds on the reality of woman as the civilizer of man as seen again through this encounter of Enkidu and Shamhat. Women set the bar of civilization because man is a creature of sexual desire first and foremost and sets his use of reason to the sexual act. When women set the bar high for sex, men will follow. When women set the bar low for sex, men will also follow. Sex brings out the elevation and dignification of man, or sex brings out the denigration and the animalization of man. This is why Aristotle remarked that sex, as well as eating, is one of the telltale signs of civilization. Moreover, animal sex is unpassionate, it's instrumental, purely utilitarian, and stems from nothing more than desire as desire. It aims only at self-pleasuring. Animals have sex because they need to have sex and nothing more. Human sex, from the standpoint of anthropological humanism, e.g. human exceptionalism, that humans really are, in fact, different from all the other animals in the world, is something far more exquisite. It represents a training in virtue, in the words of St. Augustine. It represents the civilized nature of man and society, according to Aristotle. And it represents the real power that women hold over men, according to Camille Paglia. It is, in another word, love. Humans are social and relational animals. This is the main difference between conservative anthropology and liberal anthropology for those who have studied philosophy, or if you prefer classical and modern anthropology. Conservative or classical anthropology affirms man's social and relational nature, that humans flourish when in relationships and that the basis of all civilization is the family which is brought together through the conjugal act. Liberal or modern anthropology affirms man's solitary nature, 
that humans flourish best when left alone to follow their desires for self-preservation and nothing more. Family, in particular, is seen as the biggest barrier to human freedom as well as to individual choice and movement. Those who have read uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau would know that. Enkidu, prior to sex, is again an animal. After sex, he is becoming a man. He caresses and has an intimate relationship with another human being for the first time in his life. This transforms him, literally. When he stands up and heads to the herd of gazelles, they panic and flee from him. He eventually returns to Uruk with Shamhat, where he learns the art of eating and dressing. Through sex, Shamhat introduces Enkidu to civilization and the marriage rite, where he meets Gilgamesh presiding over an event he doesn't understand because animals do not marry. Through sex, Shamhat has taught Enkidu to master his animal desires and direct them to higher goods, family, state, and society, all of which, of course, imply something beyond the self. When entering Uruk, Enkidu does not know how to eat. After sex with Shamhat and her tutelage, Enkidu knows table manners and when to eat. Again, a mastery of the passions. Man left alone, as Enkidu was before meeting and making love with Shamhat, is nothing but a brutish animal that follows his desires without any self-mastery and is incapable, incapable of social living and personal virtue. Man, though, when united with a woman, as Enkidu becomes, in his meeting and making love with Shamhat, becomes a groomed, civilized, well-spoken, and more importantly, rational being. As the author of the poem states, after arising to his feet after sex, quote, he had reason and wide understanding, end quote. The sex act and the eating rituals, along with the marriage rite that Enkidu observes, is the trinity of civilization, and all three are integrally related to each other. Ordered sexual drive leads to marriage, and the celebration of the, uh, of the union of male and female entails the eating of food, the celebratory wedding dinner or wedding banquet, banquet where the sophistication of human civilization is fully on display. Now, it's important to remember that Enkidu, having been an animal, confesses to Shamhat he does not know what is going on when he first encounters the sophistication of human society and its rituals. Sex divorced from family, eating divorced from ritual and manner, and marriage divorced uh, from social union and the social reality of family life simply returns man to his primitive and barbaric state of existence. The ordering of sex, eating, and marriage to more than just self-pleasure and self-want is the basis on which civilization rises and falls. Sex, therefore, is also the induction of a person into civilized society. For what is a man but an animal when he brutishly engages in self-gratifying sex and eating and doesn't commit himself to marriage but lives a life of licentious animalism? For what is a man but man when he exercises control in sex and eating and commits himself to a lifelong relationship of love with a woman, a woman to have children, raise them, and ensure the continuation of the sacred seed of life. This, of course, is further implied through the fact that Shamhat is a sacred harlot. The sacredness and the mystery of sex and its civilizing power bound up in the functionary religious role that Shamhat has is what is communicated through the story, and it reveals that Sumerian society had 
uh, created, perhaps organically, this great trinity of civilization. Here, the understanding of sex and civilization from Aristotle, uh, Catholicism, and Camille Paglia can be better understood. All animals, again, have sexual urges. The question for man is whether he follows the animalistic way, which is to have sex at will and purely for instrumental self-use, or whether he follows the civilized way, which is to control the urge, unite with a spouse, and procreate for the health of civil society. Moreover, as Palia asserts, the sex drive and sex act shows the real character of a person. It really brings out someone's individuality, his persona. Furthermore, women really do control the highs and lows of civilization with the sexual act, for it is woman who guards sexual ethics, and with it the animalization or the civilization, the divinization of human society and human-to-human -human interactions. If woman acts like an animal, man will follow her and be an animal. If woman acts like a dignified human, that man, then man will follow her and be a dignified human. And again, it is important to realize that this dynamic is at play when Enkidu encounters Shamhat. Shamhat is a dignified woman of civilization, and in her dignified uh, femininity, she transforms the animalistic Enkidu into a civilized man with reason, with speech, who knows the intricacies of social life. Palia notes that man is truly a creature of erotic desire. In this sense, the starting point of all humans is that of an animal, but the task of humanization is to be made human rather than to remain an animal. Ibn Rashid, Averroes, as we know him in the Latin West, one of the foremost uh, medieval Islamic philosophers, said that the task of humanization was to turn an animal into a man through the cultivated use of imagination, his soul, i.e. reason, and the ordering of his sexual instinct. This is what made man distinct from the rest of the animal kingdom. While it is true that some men are sadistic and will behave uh, as brutes engaged in the lust for domination through sexual libido, most men are not like that but take cues from the broader sexual and fetishistic mores of their environment. And this is, again, communicated in the story. Women control the future of civilization because of the mysterious and civilizing power of sex, and Shamhat demonstrates this in her bedding and civilizing of Enkidu. She is the prime mover in Enkidu's civilizing, and this we cannot forget. It is not Gilgamesh and it is not Enkidu who lead to Enkidu's civilizing. It is Shamhat who is the prime mover in his civilizing. Enkidu owes his newfound way of life, his friendships, his loyalty to country, and, the, and his very social mores to Shamhat. Shamhat is not the undignified harlot abused by Enkidu, but the sacred and mysterious feminine mystique that brings civilization into Enkidu's heart and ultimately his life. It is through their sexual encounter that Enkidu learns to master his passions, shed away his animalistic side, learn the customs and manners of civilized society, enjoy life in society, develop friendship, and become appreciative of life. Shamhat civilizes Enkidu, not Gilgamesh, and, see, and she civilizes him through the mystical union of two flesh becoming one in the sexual encounter. Uh, lastly, the, most, uh, the final unmissable aspect 
of Enkidu in the epic is also the friendship he forms with Gilgamesh. At first, they wrestle with each other, but uh, they become friends after this conflict wherein Enkidu yields to Gilgamesh and his uh, superiority. This conflict turning to yielding is a common theme in human literature. From vanquishing comes friendship, deep and intimate friendship. Moreover, Enkidu accepts his place in the pecking order with Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is the head and Enkidu the body. Uh, this theme of conflict leading to uh, friendship is visible in other great works of literature, uh, How Green Was My Valley, Captain's Courageous, but I think the most famous example in English literature is from uh, Great Expectations, when Herbert Pocket and Pip have the little fight, the little boxing match outside of Sati House when, they first, um, when they're first there and they meet Estella. In the ancient world, friendship was something intimate and deeply personal. Modernists uh, sometime, uh, sometimes read homoerotic overtures into uh, the relationship. Uh, that may very well be the case, but the real theme that is being communicated here is the intimate friendship of Gilgamesh and Enkidu. And that intimacy that they have is quite shocking to modern readers because we live in a deeply depersonalized uh, world with very few friendships. We may say we have a lot of friends, but in the traditional classical definitions of friendship offered up by like Augustine and Aristotle, uh, friends are people whom we know intimately, whom we share secret secrets with. Uh, how many friends do we really have when we consider that to be the bar of friendship? Uh, Paul Friedman, a historian at Yale, uh, has also noted the post-1970s explosion of homoerotic interpretations in classical literature, including uh, Augustine in the Confessions, which he has brushed aside as modernist ideological eisegesis. Again, uh, a lot of people today will look at that, uh, I think, for very clear ideological reasons. Nobody wants to deal with the relational, social, and intimate uh, reality of friendship, which I think the text is very much communicating, because this is also what we see in classical literature for those familiar with classical literature. There is the deep and intimate friendship of David and Jonathan in the Hebrew Bible, uh, Augustine and Olypius in the Confessions, and perhaps most famously, Achilles and Patroclus in the Aeneid. But in this way, Gilgamesh and Enkidu are the first to embody the intimate friendship narrative that is widespread throughout the ancient world. Again, the Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest extant work of literature, and therefore it is the first to encapsulate this reality of intimate friendship, which uh, just permeated the ancient world and is something that uh, I think most of us in the modern world uh, are deeply impoverished by, uh, by not having. This is because the ancient world asserted that man was not merely a social animal, but also, and more importantly, a relational animal. This theme is also found in the Genesis creation narrative with the creation of Adam and Eve. It's asserted by Plato and Aristotle and the Christian church fathers in their writing, and of course, certainly affirmed in the friendship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu. It is important to remember what Enkidu was before his civilizing and what Enkidu becomes after his civilizing. Through his civilizing, he becomes a groomed, respectable, and social person bound up with the social customs and mores of Mesopotamian society. Ancient life was excessively social. Any reader of Plato or Aristotle would know this. The social nature of the Sumerian city is on display when Enkidu enters it. There are festivals and religious rites being publicly performed for all to participate in. 
Enkidu meets Gilgamesh in a marriage ceremony where he learned to properly eat and clothe himself, which was also a very public affair in the ancient world and remains a deeply public affair in uh, traditional uh, places around the world with public processions and music playing as the bride and groom leave the church and walk the city streets. Anyone who has seen uh, The Godfather would know that the very public nature of marriage is still prominent in traditional Catholic areas in Europe. In the companionship of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, we see the social dynamic of man's nature uh, becoming crystallized for us. Gilgamesh and Enkidu are always beside one another, even unto the bitter end. Enkidu's death causes existential dread to overcome Gilgamesh. Even Enkidu, seem, even Enkidu seems angry with the fact that he is going to die, and he curses life, all the farmers, the herders, and the craftsmen, and he even curses Shamhat for his predicament. He blames Shamhat for his mortality, his consciousness of mortality. In Enkidu's cursing of life, he reflects momentarily the bitter and nihilistic strand of human experience. In cursing Shamhat, he wishes to have remained with the animals, then become aware of his mortality. Mor mortality. Ignorance, as the saying goes, is bliss. But Enkidu is assuaged from his bitterness, and he comes to bless Shamhat and the Sumerians before his death. Enkidu celebrates the gift of life even though he will die. The funeral uh, rite and ceremony Gilgamesh gives him is not merely mourning of the life and friend lost, but a celebration of a life lived. Funeral rites were important in ancient society and remain important in traditional religious sects such as Catholicism and Islam. Funeral rites are important because they are meant to give praise to the individual's life, his worth, and importance during the life they lived. Friends, family, and the whole city participate in Enkidu's funeral. Enkidu was not merely an intimate friend of Gilgamesh, he was an intimate citizen of Uruk. Gilgamesh and Enkidu's relationship is nothing short of the deeply personal and relational nature of man. The deeply personal and intimate relationships that ancient man had with his fellow man in antiquity. The very word, by the way, for society comes from the Latin word uh, socius, or soci, plural, which translates as friend. Civilization, society, is composed of friends. People whom we know, spend time with, care for, tell secrets with, and people whom we love. Gilgamesh loved Enkidu because he was his friend. Friendship in the ancient world was vastly different, as we've already touched on, than friendship in today's world. Ancient friendship was something intimate, while modern friendship, if you can even call it that, is often depersonalized. In fact, many friends simply communicate with each other uh, through digitization rather than face-to-face -face encounters. This is why moderns have often struggled, in my opinion, reading back on the friendship narratives of classical literature, Gilgamesh and Enkidu being no different. The civilizing of Enkidu, however, comes about by life in the city through his introduction to sex, eating, and marriage rites, and of course his friendship with Gilgamesh. In essence, Enkidu becomes a man by passing through the rites of passage of adulthood and becoming a member of that excellent city which Aristotle talks about in his politics. After all, Enkidu becomes an intimate citizen of Uruk, a friend of Gilgamesh, someone whom the entire city mourns for 
in his passing. And I hope we can see in this episode the great depth and intricacy of simply exploring the role of Enkidu in the Epic of Gilgamesh. He is at once the wild man or the savage man of our ancient uh, consciousness and the ancient reality of man's ascent to civilization. He is also the animal man who tames his sexual passions through love, through a woman, through the marriage rites, and becomes truly a man in the process. And of course, he is the great friend and companion of Gilgamesh and joins him on his adventures through the cedar forest, killing uh, Humbaba before uh, being mortally injured uh, by Ishtar and the Bull of Heaven, which causes the second act of the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, Gilgamesh's quest to find the plant of life, the meaning of life through wrestling with mortality and immortality. Enkidu is the most engaging and captivating character in the Epic of Gilgamesh, in my opinion, and these are but a few of the reasons why. And so when we read the Epic of Gilgamesh, when we study its characters, Enkidu in particular, we again see that this poem, this epic, is not mere fairy tale. It has great sociological, philosophical, theological, psychological insight contained in it.